Yo, what's up? Back at it once again. The Coast Gear Fun Day kicking it for you and for yours. And um, before I get into this, I'd like to thank my ancestors for giving me their knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And also, like, thank you for watching, listening, you know, taking notes and corresponding with me. I'm getting a lot of love out there on, on internet chat site lines, things like that. And it's all because of the power of you, you know what I'm saying? So much love to you watching, you know, getting down with me. Now, in this one, we continue on with Carter G. Woodson, A History of Century of Negro Migration. And uh, we've been doing a series about this, this wonderful work by this great ancestor, talk about how black people in the land of the United States of America have been escaping slavery and was free over here, and how they migrated to some different spots to get away from the white folks, basically, that didn't care for them too much like that. So on this one here, we on chapter seven, you know what I'm saying? A century of Negro migration. And then it talks about the exits to the West. Now we did it in the North. And also we talked about in the South where we was doing things too, up to the Civil War period and during the Civil War period. So this one right here continues on and talk about what we was doing in the West, chapter seven. Exodus to the West. Having come through the helicon days of reconstruction, only to find themselves to reduce to the status of slaves. Many Negroes deserted the South for the promising West to grow up with the country. The immediate causes were doubtless political. Bulldozing, a rather vague term, covering all such crimes, all crimes as political injustice and persecution, was the source of most complaint. The abridgment of Negro rights had affected them as great calamity. They had learned that voting is one of the highest privileges attained in this life, and they wanted to go where they might still exercise that privilege. That prosecution was the main cause was disputed. However, there were cases of Negroes migrating from parts where no such conditions attained. Yet, some of the whites, given in their version of the situation, admitted the violent methods had been used to intimidate the Negroes as to compel them to vote according to the dictation of the whites. It is also learned that bulldozing concerning the dethroning the non-taxpaying blacks were as presumptuous and irresponsible groups themselves, led by men of a wealthy class. Coming to the defense of whites, some said there was much persecution with which the blacks were afflicted due to the fear of the Negro uprisings, the terror of the days of slavery. Whites, however, did practically death to remove the underlying causes. They did not encourage education and made no efforts to cure the Negro or false for which slavery itself was to be blamed, consequently could not get the confidence of the Blacks. The races rather tend to drift apart. The Negroes lived in fear of re-enslavement while the whites believed that the war between the North and South was soon we renewed. Some Negroes thinking likewise sought to go to the North and be among friends. Blacks, of course, had come to regard Southern whites as their enemies, as to render impossible as a voluntary division in politics. Among the worst of all faults of the whites were their willingness to labor and their tenderness to do mischief. As there were so many to live in the labor of the Negroes, they were reduced to a state little better than that of bondage. The master class was generally unfair to the blacks no longer responsible to them slaves, the planet endeavor after the war to get their labor for nothing. The Negroes themselves had no land, no mules, no presses, nor cotton gins, and they could not acquire sufficient capital to obtain these things. They were made victim of fraud and signing contracts which they could not understand and had to suffer consequence of privations and one of aggravated robbery and murder by the Ku Klux Klan. The murder of Negroes was common throughout the South, especially in Louisiana. In 1875, General Sheldon Sheridan said that as many as 3,500 persons had been killed or wounded in that state, the great majority of whom being Negroes, and that 1,884 were killed and wounded in 1868, and probably 1,200 killed between 1868 in 1865. Frightful massacres occurred in the parishes of Boiser and Chalaluga, St. Bernard, Grant, and Orleans. 
most of these murders were for political reasons. The offenders were regarded there by their communities as heroes rather than criminals. A massacre of Negroes began in Paris of St. Laundry on the 28th of September and continued for three days, resulting in a death of 300 to 400. 13 captives were taken to jail and shot, and as many as 25 bodies were found burned in the wood. There broke out of the parish of Boise another three days of rioting during which 200 Negroes were massacred and more than 40 blacks were killed in the parish of Cotadoa during the following months. In fact, the number of murders, maimings, and whippings during these months aggravated over 1,000. The result was that the intelligent Negroes were either getting intimidated or killed so that illiterate masses of Negro voters might be ordered to refrain from voting the Republican ticket to strengthen the Democrats or be subject to starvation through operations of mischievous land tenure and credit system. What was not done in 1868 to overthrow the Republican regime was accomplished by the renewal and extended use of such drastic measures throughout the South in 1867. Certain whites maintain, however, that the unrest was due to the work of the radical politicians of the North, who had sent their emissaries south to delude the Negroes into a fever of migration. Some said it was a scheme to, to force a nomination of a certain Republican candidate for president in 1880. Others laid it to the charge of the defeat of the white and black Republicans who had been thrown from power by the whites upon regaining control of the reconstructed states. A few insisted that a speech delivered by Senator Wyndham in 1879 had given the stimulus to migration. Many Southerners said that the speculators in Kansas had adopted this plan to increase the value of their land. Then there were other theories as to the fundamental causes, each considering the charge of one political faction that some other had given rise to a movement. Bearing accounts as they were bourbons, conservative, native, whites, Republicans, carpetbag Republicans, or black Republicans. Partial observers, however, were satisfied that the movement was spontaneous and its extent that blacks were ready and willing to go. Probably no more inducement was offered to them than the other citizens among who the land companies sent agents to distribute literature. But the fundamental cause of the unrest were economic, for since the Civil War, race troubles had never been sufficient to set in motion a large number of Negroes. The discontent resulted from land tenure and credit systems, which had restored slavery in a modified form. After the Civil War, a few Negroes in those parts will receive such opportunities where possible to invest in real estate offered from the sale by impoverished or ruined planters of the conquered commonwealths. When, however, the Negro lost their political power, their property was seized on a plea of delinquent taxes and they were forced into the ghetto of towns and cities. As it became punishable by social prescription to sell Negro desirable residencies. The aim was to debase all Negroes to the status of menial labor in the conformity of the usual contention of the South, that slavery is a normal condition for Blacks. Most of the land in the South, however, remain in such large tracts held by planters of cotton. Who never thought of alienating it to the Negroes to make them a race of small farmers? In fact, they had not the means to make extensive purchases of land, even if the planters had been disposed to transfer it. Still subject to the experimentation of the white man, the Negroes accepted the plan of paying them wages. But this failed in all parts except in the sugar district where Blacks remained content say the distribution by political movements. They then tried all systems of working on shares of cotton districts, but this was finally abandoned because the planters, in some cases, were not able to advance the Negro tenant supplies, pinning the growth of the crop, and found some Negroes too indifferent and lazy to make partnership desirable. Then came the renting system, which during the reconstruction period was general in the cotton districts. This system threw the tenant on its own responsibility and frequently made him the victim of his own ignorance and rapacity of the white man. As the Zoran prices were charged for rent, usually $6 to $10 an acre for a land worth $15 to $30 an acre, 
the Negro tenant not only did not accumulate anything, but had reason to rejoice at the end of the year if he found himself out of debt. Along with this one with the criticism which furnished the capital and economic structure so harmful to the Negro tenant. This system made the Negro dependent for their living on an advance of supplies of food, clothing, or tools during the year. Secure by a lien or a crop when harvested. As the Negroes had no chance to learn the business method during the days of slavery, they fell prey to a class of loan sharks, harpies, and vampires who established stores everywhere to absorb them of their ignorant tenants and mischievous credit system, their whole income before their crops could be gathered. Some planters who sympathized with the Negro brought forward the scheme of protecting them by advancing certain necessities at more reasonable prices. As the planter himself, however, was subjugated to usury, the scheme did not give much relief. The Negro crop therefore was gathered whenever either the merchant or the planter to pay the rent for the merchant supplies was secured by a mortgage on a tenant's personal property and a pledge of growing the crop. This often prevented the Negro laborers and employment of the black tenants from getting their wages at the end of the year. For although the labor had a lien on the growing the crops, the merchants and the planters usually had this recorded first and securely, thereby supporting the law to enforce the payment of their claims. The Negro tenant then began the year with three mortgages covering all that he owned, his labor for the coming year, and all he expected to acquire during the 12 months. He paid one third of his product for the use of the land. He paid an absorbent fee for recording the contract by which he paid his pound of flesh. He was charged two or three times as much as he ought to pay for ginning his cotton. And finally, he turned over his crop to be eaten up in commissions, if any was still left to him. The worst of all the results in this ingenious system was the effect on the Negroes themselves. It made the Negro extravagant and unscrupulous. Convinced that no share of his crop would come to them when harvested, they did not exert themselves to produce what they could. They often abandoned the crop before harvest, knowing that they had already spent them. In cases, however, there were Negro tenants had acquired mules, horses, and tools upon which the speculator had a mortgage. The blacks were actually bound to their landlords to secure the property. It was so evident that in the end of the white man himself was a loser by the end of this evil scheme system. There appeared race places in the country, and improvements were wanting land laid idle and was sufficient for lack of labor and which cultivated yields and its diminishing return on account of ignorance and improvidence of those who tilling it. These Negroes as a rule had lost ambition to become landowners, preferring to invest their surplus money and personal effects. And in the case where the Negroes were induced to undertake the buying of land, they often tired of responsibility and gave up. There in the beginning of spring of 1879, therefore an immigration of Negroes from Louisiana and Mississippi to Kansas. For some time, there was a stampede of several river parishes in Louisiana from some counties that just opposite them in the Mississippi. It was estimated that five to 10,000 left their homes before the movement could be checked. Persons of influence soon busied themselves to showing the blacks the necessity for remaining in the South. And those who had not then gone or are prepared to go were proceeding to return to the plantations. This low on assignment, however, was merely temporary, for many Negroes were merely returned home to make more expensive preparations for leaving the following spring. The movement was accelerated by the work of two Negro leaders of some note. Moses Singleton of Tennessee, the self-styled Moses of the Exodus, and Henry Adams of Louisiana, who credited himself with, organize, with have organizing for this purpose as many as 98,000 Blacks. Taking this movement seriously in the convention of the leading whites and Blacks was held in Pittsburgh, Mississippi on the 6th of May, 1879. With the body controlled mainly by unpacific but diplomatic whites, General N. R. Miles of Yahoo County, Mississippi was elected president and A.W. Crandall, Louisiana, secretary. Making some of the meetings less eloquent speeches, the convention of joint appointed a committee on credentials and adjourned for the following day. 
on assembling Colonel W. L. Nugent, Chairman of the Committee, for saying certain preambles in the resolutions citing causes of the exodus and suggested remedies. Among the causes thought he were, among the causes thought he were the low prices of cotton and a particular partial failure of the crop and irrigational systems of the planting adopted in some sections whereby labor was deprived of the intelligence to direct it and the presence of the economy to make it profitable. The vicious system of credit fostered by the laws permitting the laborers and tenors to mortgage crops before they had grown or even planted. The apprehension on the part of many colored people were produced by insidious reports circulating among them that their civil and political rights were in danger or were likely to be. The hurtful false rumors of diligence dissemination by the immigrating to Kansas, the Negro would attain land, mules, and money from the government without cost to themselves and be in and become independent forever. Referring to the grievances and proposing a redress, the committee admitted that the errors had been committed by whites and blacks alike, as such in turn to control the government of the states they are represented. The committee believed that the interests of the planters, laborers, landlords, and tenants were identical and they must prosper or suffer together, and that it was the duty of the planners and the landlords of the state they represented to devise and adopt some contract by which both parties will receive the full benefits of labor governed by intelligence and economic economy. The convention confirmed that the Negro race had been placed in the U.S. Constitution and that the states there represented and the laws therefore on the plane of absolute equality with the white race and declared that the Negro should be accordingly the practical enjoyment of all civil and political rights guaranteed by said constitution and laws. The convention pledged itself to use whatever power and influence it possessed to protect the Negro race against all dangers and respect to fair expression of their will at the polls, which they apprehended might be a result of fraud, intimidation, or bulldozing on the parts of whites. And as there could be no liberty of action without freedom of thought, they demanded all elections should be fair and free, and that no repressive measures should be employed by the Negroes to deprive their own race and prior to their fullest freedom and the exercise of the fullest right of citizenship. The committee then recommended the abolition of mischievous credit system and called upon the Negroes to contradict false reports as to the crime of the whites against them and after considering the Negro rights to immigrate, urged him to proceed about it with some reason. Ex-Governor Foote of Mississippi submitted a plan to establish in every county a committee composed of men who had confidence of both whites and blacks to be the auxiliary public authorities to listen to complaints and arbitrate, advise, conciliate, or prosecute as each case should demand. But I wanted to do more than make temporary concessions the majority rejected Foote's plan. The whites thought also to stop the exits by inducing the steamboat lines, not to furnish immigration transport. Negroes are also detained by rich, detained by preferring against them false charges. Some whom were willing to let their Negroes go thought of importing whites and Chinese labor to take their place. Hearing of the movement and thinking that he could offer a remedy Senator D. W. Voorhees of Indiana introduced a resolution in the United States Senate authorizing an inquiry into the cause of the exodus. The movement, however, could not be stopped and became so widespread that people in general were forced to give it some serious thought. Men in favor of it declared their views, organized a migration society, and appointed agents to promote the enterprise to remove the free men from the South. Becoming a national treasure, therefore, the migration evokes expression from Frederick Douglass and Richard T. Greener, two of the most prominent Negroes in the United States. Douglass believed that the exodus was ill-timed. He saw it in an abandonment of the greatest principles of protection to the persons and property in every state of the Union. He felt that if the Negroes could not protect in every state, the federal government has was shorn of its right identity and full power. The late rebellion had triumphed. The sovereign of the nation was an empty vessel, and the power and authority in the individual states were supreme. He thought, therefore, it was better for Negroes to stay in the South 
then it goes to the north. As the sun was a better marketplace, was a better market for the black man's labor. Douglas believed that the Negroes should warn against the nomadic life. He did not see any more benefit in migration to Kansas than he had in years before the immigration to Africa. So on a sidebar note, he's saying the immigration to Kansas would be like the same the immigration to Africa. The Negroes had a monopoly on the labor at the South, and they would be too insignificant in numbers to have such an advantage in the North. The Negroes were potentially able to elect members of Congress in the South, but could not hold the exercise of power in other parts. Douglas believed, moreover, that this exercise did not conform with the laws of civilization migration, as carrying of a language, literature, and a lack of a superior race to an inferior, and it did not conform to the geographic laws assuring healthy migration from east to west, as in the same latitude, as this was from south to north far away from the climate in which the migrants were born. The exodus of the Negroes, however, was healthily, heartily endorsed by Richard T. Greener. He did not consider the remedy for the lawlessness of the South, but felt it was a salutary one. He did not expect the United States to give oppressed Blacks in the South the protection they needed, as there was no abstract limit to the rights of the states to do anything. He would not encourage the Negro to lead a wandering life but insists that, but in that incident that such advice was gratuitous, was gratuitous, excuse me. Greener felt in any way, in any allegory between Africanization and the migration of the West to the West as the former was promoted by slaveholders to remove free Negroes from the country and others sprang simultaneously from the class concerning its silver greed. One led out of the one country to a comparative wilderness the others better land and larger opportunities. He did not see how the migration to the North would diminish the politicality of the Negro and politics. For Massachusetts had elected Negroes to a general court, Ohio had nominated a Negro representative, and Illinois another. He has shown also that Mr. Douglas' objection on the grounds of migration North to South rather than East to West was not historical. He thought little of the advice to the Negroes to stick it out and fight it out. For the evidence that return to the unconstructed Confederates to power in the South would doom for generations the blast of political impression unknown in the annals of a free country. Greener showed foresight here and urged the Negroes to take up the desirable Western lands before it could be prevented by foreigners. As the Swedes, Norwegians, Irish, Hebrews and others were organized societies in raising funds to promote the migration for their needy to the lands. Why should the Negro be debarred? Green had no apprehension as to the treatment of Negroes would receive in the West. He connected the movement too with the general welfare of blacks, considering the promising sign that they had learned to run from persecution. Having passed their first stage, that is appealing to the philanthropists. The Negroes were then appealing to themselves. Feeling very much as Greener did, these Negroes rushed into Kansas and neighboring states in 1879. So many of them came from a systematic relief that had to be offered. Mrs. Comstock, a Quaker lady, organized for this purpose the Kansas Freeman Relief Association to raise funds and secure them food and clothing. In this work, she had the support of Governor J.P. St. John's. There was much suffering upon arriving in Kansas, but much relief came from various sources. During this year, 40,000 and 500,000 pounds of clothing and bedding and the like were used. England contributed 50,000 pounds of good and $8,000. In 1879, the refugees took up 200,000 acres of land and brought, brought 3,000 under cultivation. The Relief Association that first furnished them with supplies, teams, and seeds, which they properly used in the production of large crops. Desiring to establish homes, they built 300 cabins and saved $30,000 in the first year. In April, 1,300 refugees had grabbed around Wanadonda alone. Up to that date, 60,000 had come to Kansas and nearly 40,000 of whom arrived in destitute condition. About 30,000 of the country 
and some rented lands and others all farm as laborers, leading about 25,000 in the cities where in a kind of product conditions and hard weather, many greatly suffered. Upon finding employment, however, they all did well. Most of them becoming self-supported within a year after their arrival. And few of them coming back to the relief association for aid the second time. This is especially true for those in Topeka, Parsons, and Kansas City, Kansas. The people of Kansas did not encourage some blacks to come. They even sent messengers south to advise the Negroes not to migrate, and if they would come that way to provide themselves with equipment. When they did arrive, however, they were welcomed and assisted them as human beings. Under such conditions, the Blacks established five or six important colonies in Kansas alone between 1876 and 1880. Chief among these were Baxter Springs, Nicodemus, Morton City, and Singleton. St. John, Governor St. John's of Kansas, reported that it seemed to be honest and in good habits were industrious and anxious to work, and far so have been tried and proven to be faithful and excellent labors. Given his observation there, Sir George Campbell bore testament to the same report. Out of these communities have come some of the progressive black citizens and considered their desirability while the white neighbors had given them their cooperation, secured to them the advantages of democratic education, and honored a few of them with some of the most important positions in the state. Although the greater number of these blacks went to Kansas, about 5,000 of them sought refuge in the western states. During these years, the Negroes gradually invaded Negro territory and increased the numbers of already infiltrated into and assimilated by Indian nations. When assured of their friendly attitude towards the Indians, the Negroes were accepted as them as equals, even during the days of slavery. When the blacks on the count of the cruelties of their masters escaped into the wilderness. Here we are seen to assist it to which the invasion and the subsequent miscarriations of the black and red races extended for the reason that neither the Indian nor these migrating Negroes kept records, and the United States government had been disposed to classify all mixed breeds in the tribes as Indian. Having equal opportunity among red men, the Negroes easily seceded. A traveler in Indian territory in 1880 found their conditions usually favorable. The cozy homes and promising fields of these freemen attracted his attention as striking evidence of their thrift. He saw new fences in addition to cabins, new barns, churches, schoolhouses indicating prosperity. Given every privilege while the Indian themselves enjoyed, the Negroes could not be other than content. It was very unfortunate, however, that in 1889, when by proclamation of the President Harrison, the Oklahoma Territory was thrown open. The intense race prejudice of the white migrants and the rules of mob and the mob and the rule of the mob prevented a larger number from Negroes from settling into a promising commonwealth. Laws is extensively advertised as valuable, the land of Oklahoma became a coveted prize for the adventurous squatters invading the territory in defiance of the law before it was declared open for settlement. The rush came with all assignments of pioneer days redoubled. Stakes were set, parcels of land were claimed. Cabins were constructed in an hour and towns grew up in a day. Then came the conflicting claims as to the title and rights of the preemptive culminating in the fighting and bloodshed. And worst of all, with this disorderly group, they developed a fixed policy of eliminating the Negroes entirely. The Negroes, however, was not entirely excluded. Some had already came into the territory, and others, despite the barriers set up, continued to come. With the cooperation of the Indian, with whom they easily amalgamated and readjusted themselves and acquired sufficient wealth to rise in the economic world. Although not generally fortunate, a number of them have coal and oil lands from which they attain some handsome income. A few, like Sarah Rector, have actually become rich. Dishonest white men with their senses of unprincipled officials have defrauded and are still endeavoring to defraud these Negroes of their property, lending them money to secure by mortgage and attaining for themselves through the court appointments 
as the Negro guardians, they turn out to be robbers of the Negro. In cases, they do not live in a community where the enlightened public opinion frowns down upon this crime. During the late 80s and the early 90s, there was some interstate movement worthy of notice here. The mineral wealth of the Appalachian Mountains was being exploited. Foreigners at first were coming into this country sufficiently large numbers to meet the demand. But when the supply became inadequate, labor agents appealed to blacks in the South. Negroes then flocked to the mining districts of Birmingham, Alabama, and to East Tennessee. A large number also migrated from North Carolina and Virginia to West Virginia, and some of the few of the same group of Southern Ohio to take places on those undesirable strikers who often demand larger increases in wages than the income of their employers could permit. Many of these Negroes came to West Virginia as evidence of the increased Negro population of the state. West Virginia had a Negro population of 17,980 in 1870, 25,886 in 1880, 32,690 in 1890, 43,499 in, in 1900, and 64,173 in 1910, according to the U.S. Census. And there we have it. So, even though we still went away, they tried to stop, they, they needed our labor as we tried to leave the start of the South from the migration to Kansas and stuff like that. They tried to stop us from leaving. You know, as you said, it was a, a big debate between Frederick Douglass and R.T. Greener, the first man who, who graduated, the first black man who graduated from Harvard. And you see the contrast in the debate, you know, where really R.T. Greener was really right because, you know, they went to other places, they got elected and stuff like that. It's another video that being we talked about Oklahoma and Kansas stuff like that. Many people don't know Oklahoma was planned to be a black state. Yeah, made plans and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? But that story gets a little bit more deeper and hectic and stuff because there was a lot of towns that that sprouted up for that migration in Oklahoma and also in Kansas that you know that got some plan talked about and stuff like that a little bit of play. But there's a lot more stories that go more in depth about that. And all the things we had to go through to try to make that happen and how they got stopped from being accomplished this making oklahoma being a black state so with the migration west they tried to stop us from coming in but as you see some people migrated back down south to work in the coal mines in birmingham alabama and west virginia you know just to get the labor to be to be strike breakers when these white unions, when the white foreigners and all that stuff, like the white folks in general, form unions and stuff like that, they were bringing blacks in their strike records. So that's how they would get their money and get their stuff going on. Anywho, this is Ann Kosky of Fun Day saying hit the like button, show love, you know, about this famous ancestor and the rights of what the stuff we done did in this land and stuff like that and how we migrated and moved across. So shout out and love to this guy. Uh, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel because all we do is drop African history.